Die Linux-Distribution Ubuntu feiert dieses Jahr 20-jähriges Jubiläum. Das haben wir bei CT zum Anlass genommen, Mark Shuttleworth, den Gründer von Canonical, das ist das Unternehmen hinter Ubuntu, zum Gespräch zu bitten. Wir haben ihn gefragt, warum er eine neue Linux-Distribution gestartet hat. Wo stand der Linux-Desktop damals und wo steht er eigentlich heute? Was hätte er eigentlich gerne anders gemacht? Mehr zum Ubuntu-Jubiläum gibt es online und in der CT2324. Zu Open-Source-Themen schreiben wir auch einen kostenlosen Newsletter namens Open Source Spotlight, der wöchentlich erscheint. Den Link zur Anmeldung findet ihr in der Beschreibung. Jetzt aber viel Spaß mit dem Interview in voller Länge. So, Mark, uh, thank you very much for, for joining us. And the first question we have for you. So, uh, over 20 years ago, you um, sold your comedy uh, Thought or Thought. I'm not quite sure on the pronunciation. And uh, you made uh, some good money. So, then you flew to space and you could have done pretty much anything. So, why did you want to start a new Linux distribution? Well, I was very inspired by the work of open source communities and specialists. Mm -hmm. um, um, a lot of what I had been able to achieve in the late 1990s was only possible because of open source. So I wanted to give something back um, to you know the communities that had supported me. And I also wanted to, to increase the opportunities for others to do their own kind of entrepreneurial or educational or scientific magic with open source. So I thought that if, um, if we could solve the usability challenge of Linux back then, then many more people could um, could could uh, could benefit from the contributions of open source uh, engineers, and um, you know that those contributions would have bigger impact in the world one way or the other. So it seemed like a nice um, challenge. Um, I was also I was also a little insecure about whether I had been just lucky as a as an entrepreneur or whether I had been quite savvy about how I'd navigated the, the complexities of that opportunity. So I wanted to do something that was commercially very difficult and building an operating system and then giving it away and then making it commercially successful, that seemed to be very difficult. Uh, so it was interesting for lots of reasons. It became a bit of an obsession. And I think if I'd known that I would end up this bald and this gray this soon, I, I might not have done it, but I'm, I'm on reflection, kind of very grateful for uh, for everything that I've learned along the way and all the fun people I've got to work with. And to a certain extent, the impact that we've already had is um, is is great. Mm -hmm. So can you elaborate a little bit more on your background in open source and the usability challenges Linux was facing at the time? Well, I studied um, information systems, which is kind of like the business side of technology. Um, and I was doing that and finance together as, at the University of Cape Town. And at that, while I was there at university, the internet arrived in South Africa in universities um, initially. So I became really interested in, in the internet and how um, it would change business and change societies, change, change culture. Um, And I started working uh, as a student. I, I started that company, Thought, actually just as a consulting company to help local businesses get on the internet. So this was really how I learned the, 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 under, the underpinnings of, of what today is, you know, IP and the internet and, and, and so on. Um, someone gave me a stack of floppies, um, which was Slackware. And so that was really transformative for me. I started to work with Linux. Um, I couldn't study Linux because the, the, the degree program, the professors weren't, weren't interested in that. But I started to use it to kind of deepen my understanding of the internet and help companies get online. Um, and I imagined, you know, I was, I was looking for a business opportunity, which you could do from South Africa um, and, you know, South Africa didn't have a lot of money and it didn't have a lot of bandwidth. Um, but this, this area of, um, identity, cryptographic identity and establishing international secure communication, that seemed like an opportunity, um, for various reasons. Um, so I pursued that as a student and then grew that after graduating, grew that into a certificate authority. Along the way, I had to essentially build all the business systems behind that, and all of that was done on, on um, Debian. I became a Debian developer as part of that process because there were various things that I wanted to use that weren't Debs at the time, and I thought if I contributed them, then 
that would be one way to give back. Um, so I finished that kind of journey um, as a um, not a very deep expert Linux kernel person, but certainly with an uh, understanding and appreciation for how a Linux system is put together and how Debian as a community worked. Um, those things were kind of real to me when uh, when I sat down to think about what to do next. So what was the reason to give back in the specific way of founding a new distribution and not, I don't know, supporting Debian or some other way of, yeah? Well, actually, I, I, I did do that. So that, that was the sort of starting point. Um, I, in fact, I, I, at the time, rather naively, I thought that Debian would just win on its own. Um, when the, the other major distributions started to go proprietary, um, I thought, well, that's game over. You know, Debian is technically much better um, and uh, it has a much bigger community and has a much better technology for packaging at the time. I, I still think Debs are you know, better than RPMs in, in, in many sort of fundamental technical ways. Um, uh, and so I sort of assumed that Debian would just win because it had that technical and community merit. Um, and it was a hard lesson for me to watch, right? I saw the, the Linux distributions that went proprietary actually being very successful. And at that time, Debian was, was struggling a lot, was struggling a lot to make releases and, um, You know, it, it seemed kind of stuck. Um, so my first efforts were to to um, encourage Debian to do certain things, and I just found that, you know, what what I what I um, initially interpreted as kind of resistance to change and so on, I now think about slightly differently. I now think about it as that Debian has a set of values that are very true to Debian and actually very important and very unique. But at the time, I found that I, I couldn't convince people in Debian to um, to move in the way that I thought they needed to move to, to get back in the game effectively. And so on that basis, then I thought, well, why not start kind of a, uh, the, the other side of the coin to Debian, um, which I still feel very strongly Ubuntu is, right? Ubuntu and Debian are two sides of the same coin. We've consistently made choices to stay you know, attached and joined at the hip. Um, but we we're able to bring something into the Debian ecosystem that hadn't been there before. Um, and I think the, the, that approach has worked very well, right? Debian still very much owns its story, has a very clear set of values that you know, can't be pushed around by me or anybody else. And I've come to really appreciate that. On the other hand, I think the existence of Ubuntu has punched that ecosystem right to the forefront of the broader kind of understanding of open source. Um, and I say that not to detract from some of the very cool things that are happening in Arch and in Nix, which are which are also kind of interesting. But I think there is the you know the, the Debian and Ubuntu um, story is still very central to to how most people think about using Linux in production, right, for experimentation and production. Mm. So from the get-go, um, Ubuntu was very focused um, or was developed with end users in mind. So what was your, your reasoning behind that? Well, I, I was able to see clearly that um, I could, I could um, be very bold as an entrepreneur if I could build on top of open source. But it was really hard to build on top of open source. You know, In those days, it was just really hard to get it onto a laptop. It was really hard to set up and, and, and administer. Um, and so I thought, look, if, if we can solve that problem, then millions and millions more people will have access to open source. And if they have access to open source, I don't know what they'll do with it, but I'm sure it'll be interesting, right? And that, I think, really, we have seen. Now, today, many, many more students have access to open source. It's a normal part of most um, kind of computer science or other curricula. Um, there isn't perceived to be uh, you know, a lot of friction associated with that at the level of getting a single server up and running or getting a, getting a, a laptop up and running, right? So it was a way of saying, look, we have this beautiful thing that open source contributors are, are contributing to, but it's not reaching as many people as it could reach. So let's solve that, right? And that way, you know, this thing's going to get better as fast as all the brilliant innovators in open source can make it better. But all of them will then have a bigger impact because more people will be able to consume um, what they're doing. But was, what was your approach to bringing open source to the masses? Um, making it easy, making it pretty, making it just work effectively. 
Um, uh, and today that work continues. You know, if I think about WSL, for example, it's a really interesting way for the masses to get access to open source. Um, uh, you know, for Mac users, we make multipass, right? So that you can, you can, you have a Mac, you just install multipass and then with one command, you get an environment and you've got open source at your fingertips. Um, uh, I, I think it's tempting always just to look at the things that you can control, but I think you also have to think about all the people who, who in other environments, right. And, and sometimes they don't have any choice about being in those environments and, and do some work to enable them to get access to open source as well. So looking back, I mean, it sounds like things worked pretty much like you, you wanted them to work out. Um, is there something you would have done differently or do you say like, no, I mean, it has been 20 years now, but we're actually not there yet. Or uh, are you there? <laughs> I mean, I, <laughs> there are so many things that didn't work out exactly as I thought they would work out. Um, so the original business plan for Ubuntu was Netflix and Spotify and Dropbox and, and so on, right? The idea was that um, uh, in, a, in a connected world, you could shift the sustainability model away from licensing software, which is difficult to do in open source, towards services, and then you know, a free platform would make sense. Uh, and that has happened, you know, if I look at Apple today, right, you, you don't pay for Mac OS, right? Um, I don't think you necessarily even pay for Windows upgrades these days, right? Um, the, the services story, I think, has moved to the center of the economics for, for, for platform software. But we completely failed to do that, right? I, I thought we needed to do a Linux in part because at the time, if, if we tried to do that on Windows, then we were likely just to get crushed by the, the Windows people, right? Absorbed into Windows uh, or, or, you know, have a Windows version, you know, a thing built into Windows that did what we did. I didn't see iOS and Android coming, which are the things that ultimately made it possible to do Dropbox and Spotify and so on. That was the first big mistake. And the second big mistake is I underestimated how expensive it would be to build something like a Spotify or a, or a Netflix or Dropbox. I mean, I thought I had a lot of money, half a billion dollars or something, but it turns out all of those things have each consumed like tens of billions of dollars. So I would have been dead in the water. So actually I had to, I had to, you know, really rethink things. Um, and that's why we ended up essentially largely anchored around an enterprise play and so on, which isn't very innovative. You know, Red Hat had done that before. Sousa had done that before. It was a bit of a you know punch in the face for me, right? Like I was just wrong and failed <laughs> on a bunch of those things. Um, so we had to then regroup and reshape and and build a business around the enterprise story for Ubuntu. Um, I think we continue to invest back in Linux for human beings, but we're doing it from a you know a position where the enterprise is the is the commercial tentpole effectively, and that is the sort of the Robin Hood part of what we do, right? Mm -hmm. So um, speaking of um, Linux for, for human beings, so some might say the focus of the distribution has shifted more and more to enterprise and servers, IoT, cloud technologies. Do you agree with this uh, sentiment? Definitely, but not permanently. So, you know, back in 2015, 2016, I literally nearly, nearly lost my shirt, right? So I, things were very, very desperate. I had to be uh, pretty ruthless in what we kept going with and what we stopped doing. Um, uh, and so we had a very strong kind of pivot to the cloud, IoT, as you said, enterprise, the server, essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, nowadays, private cloud, Kubernetes, public clouds, you know, these are all the big reasons why large companies adopt Ubuntu and, and engage with Canonical, which funds us. But once we got profitable, we again turned around back to the desktop and started investing more in the desktop. Um, so I hope, I hope. I think people have noticed that the last couple of desktop releases have had quite a lot of, you know, energy and sexiness, right? Like interesting things going on. Some people like it, some people don't like it. But at the end of the day, I think that team is now, you know, again, a focus for investment uh, and is, is, uh, is, um, uh, is growing. Um, and that's not commercial, right? That's, that's mainly because I, I would love the world to have a really wonderful set of choices um, for free software desktops. We've also started working more recently again with the KDE community um, and and essentially um, kind of doing pathfinding exploration together as to, again, how we can get the diversity of Linux to, to 
not essentially hold us all back, right? Rather to be kind of like creative and fun and, and innovative, but not as as fragmentary as it as it can be. So what would you say, um, who's the desktop for in um, uh, right now? So who's the main target audience in 2024 for the Ubuntu desktop? Well, I can think of, I can think of a couple of different groups that, that we actively invest in sort of meeting their needs. One is the, the person who wants a secure private desktop um, just because they either they don't have the resources to use the commercial offerings or they find them difficult, or they, um, they, they, they're worried about privacy, for example, right? So that is the, the, the real kind of Linux for human beings story. They're, you know, I don't care if you're never going to build great software. I don't care if you're never going to pay us money. I want you to have a, a, um, a wholesome, secure environment where you can explore what's possible in compute. Um, Then you have the developer audience, right? And those are people who um, they they probably not customers of Canonicals, but I think they could do interesting things in the world. I want them to be able to feel like they can take a laptop, they can put Ubuntu on it, and then they have access to literally all the best stuff in open source in a way where if they're successful, if their ideas work out, they can go to production and 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 really believe in it, right? And then you have the enterprise, right? And enterprises tend to care about things like compliance, conformance, um, auditing, um, standards of various forms, um, management, and things like that, right? So those three groups are related but different, right? Um, I would say we have teams that would say their mission is one or the other of all of those. And then we have some teams who are just focused on you know, making the compiler as great as it can be or making the kernel as great as it can be. And they don't think in terms of those different audiences, but, they, but they're ultimately working for all of them. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Is that the, like, would you say this applies to Linux in general or, or the, the Linux desktop in general? Or is this like a, a Ubuntu focus? Now, what do you think about the, the status of, of the Linux desktop? When is the year of the Linux desktop? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I have to give credit to both Android and Chrome OS, right? Because they have both fundamentally changed um, what we think of as what Linux can do in the world. Um, and, you know, if I go back to 2004 when Ubuntu started, neither of those things existed, and, and they've both done really, really well, right? Um, I would like to go back to the core desktop itself, right? I think the opportunity is still there to build beautiful, secure, usable stuff. We we had a first go at that with Unity, um, and you know, again, I nearly lost my shirt doing that. So I have a bit of PTSD um, from from that experience. But on the other hand, you know, I think I think. We kind of owe it to the community and the and the, the open source world to keep investing in the desktop experience, right? Um, um, the, the nature of that is a little fragmented, right? KDE is an important desktop. Uh, GNOME is an important desktop, right? Mate, uh, each of these environments, you know, have their communities. I don't I don't want to exclude them from you know from what we're trying to do. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I would genuinely love to see a winning, you know, stylish, beautiful, enviable, pure consumer desktop experience for those people that I talked about in the middle, right? The Linux for humans, human beings crowd, the people who aren't developers and they aren't corporate, they just want something that's great to use. Um, mm -hmm. So can you put a put a number on it, um, like uh, how many resources or development resources and percentage wise are allocated uh, to um, desktop development? Um, I can say it's tens of people who work on the desktop. Now that covers lots of different aspects of it. Um, I can also say it's growing um, because now that we're profitable, I, I enjoy investing in that. That team is very passionate and they They represent really the face of Ubuntu. You know, when, when you say Ubuntu to a lot of people, they literally think, oh, I can picture it in my mind. And for most people, that, that is an Ubuntu desktop, right? Um, uh, we also have teams that work on the cloud story and also have teams that work on the server story and the IoT story. 
but mentally for most people ubuntu is the desktop right um, all right you already mentioned unity there's many other projects like this uh, which uh, canonical slash ubuntu started which were not exclusively for ubuntu right? they were targeted at the wider ecosystem mm. uh, what was the motivation behind this this drive to to provide tools which are not just for ubuntu and like was it a consideration to do it just for ubuntu um i think it's i think it's it's just part of being part of the open source community that you try to publish things in a way that they can have an impact outside of what you imagine they could have right um so upstart for example there was a canonical engineer who was very passionate about that problem this was back in the in the sysv init days um, and so he was able to make the case that we should do upstart and we did upstart in fact upstart is still being used in chrome os right so uh, you know i think that's part of what's great about open source that when you have passionate people who have technical insights and understandings and if they can find a space to explore that and be successful then that thing can have a life beyond uh, you know necessarily the company or the, or the or the or the project that it started in so i think that's a nice a nice aspect of open source. Um, not everything that you do that way is going to be successful or is going to be the, you know, the end destination. There's always creative destruction, right? You sometimes you do things and they win for a while and then you have to abandon them in favor of better things that have come from somewhere else. Right? Generally, I've tried to set the tone that we should be, um, we should be uh, willing to ship other people's stuff if it's the best, but we should also be willing to lead if other people aren't doing, you know, aren't, aren't attacking the problems that we think are interesting. Um, it's it's complicated in, in the community because you'll be criticized for not innovating and criticized for innovating equally, <laughs> sometimes by the same people, right? Um, uh, but, but I do think it's part of the responsibility of being one of the platforms that lots of people yeah, uh, engage with and play with. And to a certain extent, again, being one of the commercially successful platforms, even though we're much smaller than Red Hat and SUSE, being commercially successful, I think, increases the responsibility on us to do something with that that might have a broader impact, right? Um, so so I, I always tell the team, you know, in, in 20 years time, Linux is going to look fundamentally different to what it does today. You know, if you go back 20 years, you know, the last 20 years have shown us that Linux will change radically um, over over that sort of period. So if we if we just froze and just did what we do today, well, then we'd be obsolete in, in 20 years time. Um, so we have kind of two responsibilities. On the one hand, we owe it to our existing users to keep the platform that they depend on stable and unsurprising, right? And then we also owe it to that same user base to be kind of, successfully surprising in inventing the future, right? Uh, and those are sort of directly, uh, you know, in tension with each other, those two responsibilities, right? Um, but we carry them both and we have to carry them both as well as we possibly can. And, you know, sometimes that's controversial. Sometimes we're successful, sometimes we aren't. Uh, but we, we can't be shy about like taking a deep breath and trying to invent the future. Many of these projects I think you could say had have had trouble being adopted by the community. Um, I would say sometimes not even on, on technical reasons. Um, is there anything like, why do you think that is the case now? Why is it often, like for example, Upstart? Yes, it's still used in Chrome OS, but it has in the in the basic desktop lost to system D. No? There's other examples, like you mentioned Unity, there's the Mir display server. Um, there's always been a lot of tension in the community and in the end, the the perception might be that the ubuntu product did not make it what do you think is the reason for that i think it's interesting i think i think when you do things that um that are successful there's a there's a, it's it's tempting for people to essentially say you know, well obviously that was going to be successful right that 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 was very easy and then when you do something that isn't successful then that can be called out right um so th there's a certain amount there of 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 um i think over um, uh, overemphasis of things that either didn't work or, or you know, got outmaneuvered one way or the other. Um, uh, I think sometimes th there are real technical concerns. You know, uh, I was 
gutted that we stopped work on Unity. But on the other hand, while I thought the design work on Unity was great, I didn't think the engineering was great. And so, you know, to a certain extent, that that was a healthy outcome, right? The, like the engineering there wasn't great, right? Um, if we were to go back into the desktop environment game, I would want to learn a lot of lessons from how we did that and say, well, if we're going to go get back into that game, well, then the engineering has to be technically outstanding, right? Technically outstanding. Even if we do that, um, uh, you know, anything we, we do will attract a certain amount of controversy. You can, you can, you can get a certain enough, you know, amount of brownie points just for saying negative things about uh, a platform that's very widely used, right? You'll get, you'll get attention that way. I've just learned to live with that, right? I, I do think fondly of the days when we were crazy and disruptive and nobody cared, right? Like when we came out, we did six month releases. That was crazy. All the, all the existing platforms said, you know, it can't be done. Now it's fairly normal, right? But it was radical, crazy, disruptive. Um, many of the things that we've done, you know, essentially embracing wider contributions, translation, community leadership, um, uh, art, and so on into the community, those things, it's easy to take them for granted now, but they were kind of radical, crazy moves. They just weren't controversial because we, we didn't matter, right? We, we weren't Sousa, we weren't uh, Red Hat, you know? So um, they weren't controversial purely because people didn't care. Now, in, in a sense, if we, if we innovate, if we're a bit radical, well, then it'll be controversial. And to a certain extent, I respect that, right? Like I say, we do have a responsibility to our users to, to keep their, to, you know, to, to not surprise them badly uh, and, to, and, to, and to keep their platform stable and so on. They're not asking for change effectively, right? But on the other hand, uh, if we became shy to innovate and be radical and be crazy, right, well, then the future would go to someone else. Right, someone else would have to invent the future, and I'm interested in that. Like, I'm I'm really interested in where containers are going. I'd like to build something with that interest. You know, I'd like to do something with that. I, my colleagues are really interested in the future of this piece or the future of that piece. Mm -hmm. I think they've earned the right to 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 try things and to build things. Um, I you know I can't promise that we'll always get it right. Um, I think we've got a pretty good track record of adopting what's working, right, or allowing it. You know, we have Flatpak in the archive, but Fedora doesn't have snaps in the archive. You know what I mean? They, they, <laughs> I, I think we play a more open game than, than most in recognizing that you, you want to enable people to try different things and, uh, and allow users to use what they want to, want to use and then make the technical best project win. So um, speaking of uh, competitors, so um, Ubuntu has to collaborate um, on uh, numerous projects in the Linux and open source ecosystem, sometimes alongside competitors, for example, like in the case with the uh, desktops, no desktop especially. So what are the challenges um, associated with that? Um, there's, there's no surprises there, right? I think that, 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 that dance is, is well understood. Um, you know, ultimately, You, you need to be respectful of, of people's projects, their, their, their projects to a certain extent, right? That's, that's that. Um, and they need to be respectful of, of what derivatives essentially will evolve and do. Those relationships are always a little bit stressed and a little bit testy, but it's part of the kind of how, how a project moves forward, whether that's KDE or GNOME or, or something else. Um, uh, I think I think we are always going to be part of those projects, even if we were to do another Unity. Right when we did Unity, we continued to work on GNOME, right, uh, and, and and provide GNOME. And ultimately, I'm very grateful because when Unity failed, we were able to fall back on that relationship, right. And that's part of the beauty of open source, right. So um, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to kind of get drawn into the drama of of interpersonal dynamics, right? Like it's normal. Uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be too stressed about it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So how has your relationship with uh, Microsoft uh, transformed over the, over the decades? Or has it? Ha or has it <laughs> at all? Sorry, mm -hmm. what's that? Or has it transformed? <laughs> well, I, I think, 
there's something important to understand about the difference between organizations and and individuals you know um i think it's it's important to understand that an organization will fundamentally change over time because the people in that organization will fundamentally change and leadership will change and priorities will change and so you know uh, you have to look at an organization as it is today and say well what what can i work with and what can i not work with and what would be constructive and what would not be constructive right uh, so if I look back at Microsoft in the 90s, you know, this was an organization that was clinging to a kind of power in technology that I thought was deeply unhealthy. And, you know, the, I think the, m most people at Microsoft today would agree. Right. Uh, uh, so bug number one. Uh, and, and, you know, we took a very principled stand against software patents, for example, when the leadership at the time of Microsoft was really pushing that as a way to kind of, I think, trap uh, the Linux players, we said no, right? They were offering money. We needed it, but we said no, right? Others took it. Um, but when the cloud team at Microsoft knocked on our door, uh, you know, we spoke to them, and they were kind of rebels inside Microsoft. They were ones who were saying, look, we're going to do Linux, even though the boss <laughs> is skeptical, right? So they were the rebels inside Microsoft that were doing Linux, and they were trying to do it properly. They had to. They knew they had to. Right. So very quickly we said, okay, we'll work with you on cloud. Right. And so this is kind of separating, you know, the concerns, you know, institutions are always complex and they're going to evolve. You should ultimately figure out if there's a set of people that you have common values with, you can do constructive things with, then you should be willing to do that. Right. And so we did with the Azure team and that's worked out really well. They have become a force in cloud. They um, they care to do it well. Their Linux story is, has you know come along in leaps and bounds, right? Um, and they're now running the business, which means that the rest of Microsoft, I think, has leadership that's much more open to open source, right? So I think that's a good story. Um, and you know, in, any time people you know rattle sabers with regard to an organization and what it did 20 years ago uh, you know i say well hold on a sec that's not really fair on the people who are there today on the other hand if people in an organization that you love start doing terrible things to it well then you've got to call them out for that right so that's that's just how it is so would you say nowadays that working with microsoft is like working with any other linux distributor or is there still a difference because it's the big guy from redmond Look, there will be people in Redmond for whom Windows Ubuntu is a zero-sum game. You know, that laptop either shipped from Dell with Windows on it or Ubuntu on it, that's a zero-sum game. And and I completely empathize, and, and I'm sure they completely empathize with us, that at the end of the day, that's going to be a competitive dynamic. But there are lots of other people in Redmond for whom, um, you know, having Ubuntu be welcome on Azure and and having Azure be a great place to run Ubuntu and having Ubuntu reflect the, the innovation that's happening in Azure, you know, all of those things are the basis for a very um, open and productive, collaborative technical relationship, right? Um, and, you, you know, on balance, I would say the leadership there today sees cloud and AI and so on as very important things for Microsoft to get right. Um, and they would see Linux and open source and Ubuntu as part of that story. So there's, there's ample grounds for good collaboration, right? Also competition, right? There's a, there's a Linux team at Microsoft that would also be a bit zero sum game. That VM is either Azure Linux or it's Ubuntu. Um, and that's okay, that's healthy, right? As long as the dynamics ultimately are, are constructive and healthy, I, I, I don't mind working with organizations that we compete with. We, uh, you asked about, you know, communities where you have competing interests but the same is true in, in on the commercial side of things right we have good reasons to work well with vmware right and also good reasons to compete with vmware right um, that's 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 healthy i i always ask my team to be you know, the best partner and the best competitor and do both of those with a smile and just see how we play out right
So um, you mentioned that the developers are excited about um, stuff like um, containers and so on and um, concepts like immutability, atomicity, they are gaining traction, gaining popularity right now. So we are inter interested in what Ubuntu has in store for us in that regard. Well, so our story there is Ubuntu Core. Um, and the approach that we're taking there, I think, is quite distinctive, right? I think it's it's quite different to the approach that the, the Red Hat family um, are exploring and quite different to the approach that the SUSE family are exploring. And if you step back and just think about what's best for open source, I think it's I'm quite comfortable with the idea that for a while, at least, there'd be three quite radically different, you know, ways, to, approaches to that problem being explored, right? Um, I, I feel very good about the technical choices that, that um, we've made. Um, uh, when you make, you know, Ubuntu Core is an Ubuntu system where every piece of software in that system is a, is a um, immutable component. So it has the properties of immutability, but it also has the properties of composition. You can essentially extend that system by adding components. Those components have the transactional properties of an immutable system. For me, that's a very nice balance, right? Between the sort of AB approach where you have one big blob and you have two versions of that big blob, mm -hmm. right? Um, and the, the kind of messy tra traditional system where you have lots of files and those files are all kind of intertwi intertwined and intertangled, right? So I think our approach is interesting. Um, I prefer it to the file system based approach. You know, if you look at the the SUSE approach with micro OS, again, I think it's technically excellent. There's very good people working on it. But the, the concern for me with working at the file system level is that I think it becomes harder for users to understand what's going on. With Ubuntu Core, you can say, okay, those are literally the files, those are the components, and they're very visible on a normal file system. When you use fancy features in the file system like ZFS or ButterFS or, or um, BcacheFS, the whole thing becomes a little bit more mysterious. When things go wrong, it's a little harder to fix it, right? Because you're using under the hood capabilities in the file system. There's another challenge, which is that often um, in a system, you have different changes happening. You may have a database that's writing transactions into a database, and you may have a package manager that's essentially upgrading packages, for example, right? And so if you if you decide you want to roll back one of those, you end up, if that's all on a transactional file system, you end up rolling back both of them at the same time. You can't separate those concerns. Whereas with the snap-based approach, the components, the, the software components are separate from the essentially the data storage, which is in the file system. So I like that. I think it's interesting. I think it's tasteful. Will it win? I don't know. <laughs> Will it be widely adopted? I don't know. <laughs> but I, I wouldn't be surprised. You know what I mean? Often we've done things and people have said those are terrible ideas and canonical are terrible people and how dare they do that. And then a little while later, you see other people doing something that looks very similar and it all goes quiet, right? So I wouldn't be surprised if, if other platforms adopt similar thinking to, to the ideas that we've explored because frankly, they're working very well, right? The IoT story with Ubuntu Core is fantastic, right? You put a device down there, and for 10 years, it would just it would just keep getting updates, and you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to look at it. If there's a problem, it'll roll back, right? Um, I can't wait to have a desktop that has that same feeling, right? Where I come up a level, I have you know I can choose my applications. I have composition. Um, those applications can get updated at a speed that suits them from you know whatever vendor or, or upstream community is driving them. Um, but the whole thing feels more kind of on rails and predictable and and secure and so on. Now, that's a lot of work to achieve. Desktops, you know, in, a, in an interesting way, they're actually really hard because all the components want to talk to each other in very rich ways, right? That's different than the kind of cloud server world where those components only talk to each other over the network. In the desktop, you have all kinds of low-level inter integration that has to work, right? So, uh, so the desktop is a really interesting kind of torture test for, for our ideas with snaps and core and so on. Mm -hmm. I think we'll get there. So, so what are the most dire problems you need to solve to get um, Ubuntu core ready for desktop use? <laughs> 
Well, one of the most interesting things we've just progressed progressed very nicely, right? So, um, and that is places where the user wants to do something that um, uh, may be the right thing to do, but we can't help them with that decision. So, you know, we will we can look at an application and say, well, this would be normal for that application, right? The, your mail client should be able to read and write to the, your, your mail directories on your system, and it should be able to talk over the network to to, to mail servers. But you know, we probably don't want your mail client to be able to get your password file because because um, that could be a, an attacker that's compromised the mail client. You know, it, it's it's very exposed. Sounds scary to me, <laughs> right? And now it wants your password file, so it shouldn't just get your password file, right? But what if you are emailing your IT person or your or your professor, your answer to and, and the answer to the question from the professor is your password file, right? So now you have a real use case to attach your password file to an email. That's a terrible idea normally, but what if you want to do it, right? So we've just landed in in the kernel, in the App Armor community, and in SnapD, you know, a whole bunch of different pieces, and in the desktop to enable the sandbox of the email client to essentially say, well, I, I want access to that file and then have the user presented with a pretty reasonable question, which is, hey, do you want your email client to have access to this file? Are you trying to do this? Is this really what you want, right? Now, of course, if a, if a hacker has compromised your email client and that thing pops up, it would be a surprise to you. And hopefully most users would say no. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, uh, that's why we have to do a lot of UX work to make that um, um, prompt a reasonable prompt, right? Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, if you just went, you know, I want to attach a file and you went and clicked through your path and said, here, it's this file over here. And then you get a permission thing saying, do you want your email client to read that file? You would say, yes, that's, that's what, exactly what I'm trying to do right now, right? So that's a big usability enhancement. Previously, that boundary, that shell, that sandbox, right? was very hard on snaps, right? Uh, and that's good from a security point of view. And it's fine in IoT where you, you don't really do any dynamic operations. That's kind of the point, right? Like you put those things in the wall and you leave them, right? Mm -hmm. um, but in the desktop, your users are using, right? They, they, they do things all the time. And so we needed this mechanism to essentially take the sandbox that's a well-specified sandbox but allow the user to break out of it under control and be able to audit and report that, right? Your CISO should be able to say, across all of my developer workstations, is anybody allowing the email client to access the SSH keys, right? Because they shouldn't be, right? Uh, and so that's taken a long time to get to that level of sophistication. If we had just stopped doing work on snaps because we didn't like you know, the, the Reddit flame wars, then we wouldn't, we wouldn't have got here, right? So we have to have slightly thick skins and open minds and punch forward, right? So how, how long will it take until we have uh, a core-based desktop? Will it take another 20 years? <laughs> <laughs> no, it won't take another 20 years. <laughs> this piece that I'm talking about now has been a big part of the, the usability challenge for us, right? Because we, we'd come from the place where the security rigor was the first thing we needed to get right. And we were trying to add desktop usability to that. Other people have come from a different place where they're saying, well, let's start with desktop usability and then try and make it more immutable or more or more secure, right? So, you know, we had to kind of cross the desert. Um, I feel pretty good about us having a, um, a version of that that sophisticated users could play with um, in, in uh, 2025. Um, I don't feel in a rush, you know what I mean? At the end of the day, if Fedora is going to win with, with Flatpak and so on, that's that's okay, right? Um, if SUSE is going to win with MicroOS, that's okay. I think we should focus on trying to get it right, trying to get it technically excellent, trying to get the performance and user experience amazing. And if that takes a bit longer, it takes a bit longer. Are there any other like big transformations you you see on the horizon for for Ubuntu or maybe for the Linux desktop in general? Um, the the Ubuntu story is quite broad, right? So at the moment we we span um, I would say high end IoT. In other words, to run Ubuntu Core, you need to you need to be able to have a reasonably sized disk because you have three copies of 
each component in the system, so you can roll back and so on. Um, and you also need to have a reasonably sized CPU because you're actually running all of Ubuntu, right? You're running all of Ubuntu. If you think about much smaller Linux devices, then then that doesn't make sense. Do you know what I mean? You aren't going to need all of Ubuntu on a microwave oven, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and I really like to help people who are making microwave ovens to, to enable them to use open source, right? The best thing they've got there is Yocto, right? Which is pretty cool technology, but it's, it's pretty scary from a maintenance point of view, right? So there's, there's lots of sort of open territory still to explore in IoT. Um, on the cloud, I think it's very interesting. I am getting you know, as the as the hype cycle of Kubernetes has calmed down, I'm getting more and more confident in uh, in the approach that we've taken with Kubernetes, is to keep, which is to keep it simple, keep it standard, keep it open source, you know, and just do best of breed, just works, so people can focus on on other problems rather than Kubernetes, right? So uh, on the cloud side of things, a lot of our work right now is kind of like a second generation of microcates. Um, where we kind of learn from everything, all the all the positive engagement that we've had there. It's a great community, um, but do something that is you know even leaner, more focused, um, more just works, um, and where you know you, you can genuinely say wherever you are in the world, whatever platform you on, if you can get an Ubuntu VM, you can get a Kubernetes without thinking about it, and that Kubernetes will be natively integrated with your networking and storage, whatever that is, right? So there's a bunch of work that we're doing on the on the kind of cloud side. Uh, in fact, work that we do with the public clouds, work that we do with um, uh, other companies that are in kind of infrastructure engineering, competitors of ours, to kind of really clean up that Kubernetes experience and make it make it a kind of a, a kind of a no brainer, right? When something's hot and sexy, everybody's got to have their own version of it, and everybody's got to overcomplicate it and over engineer it because it's the hot and sexy thing, right? But once that hype dies down, there's an opportunity to kind of go in and understand what was important out of all of that and then deliver that with no fuss. So, so I'm quite excited about that on the Kubernetes, on the, on the cloud and distributed systems side of what we're doing at the moment as well. Um, and I'm really excited for people who have home labs, for example. I'm really excited about the micro cloud story. Um, and so micro cloud is basically a single in single command install on each node in your home lab with a, then a cluster command um, on each of those nodes and you've got a little cloud, right? It's a small cloud, it's a baby cloud, but it's got compute network and storage, it'll give you VMs on demand. You know, it's a really nice way to take a, a, a three node home lab or six node home lab and make it a little cloud. Um, so I'm hoping that that's something that people will really enjoy uh, and and kind of essentially give everyone a cloud in their pocket um, to then do their innovating and dev and test and so on. on. So when I observe the cloud landscape, um, I see a lot of projects revalidating their use of open source licenses and switching to open-ish licenses or source available licenses. Um, what do you think What are the challenges to um, sustainably develop open source today? Uh, this is such an interesting question. This is, I think, one of the most important questions, right? Like, what, what, what will power innovation? You can't assume that it will just be, you know, goodwill that will power innovation. You have to think about some sort of economic machine that that essentially makes sure that that can be professional goodwill, right? Um, otherwise, you know, we're we're stuck, right? Um, so f for me, per, I think it's very important also not to not to dictate licensing to other people. People are going to explore licensing and people's circumstances are, are, are different. So I, I don't feel in a position to tell some project what license they should use. Right. There are reasons, I think, to use more permissive licenses, the BSDs and the Apaches. And there are reasons to use more um, uh, copyleft type licenses. Um, for me, I love the free software story. I'm not going to tell everybody that they're terrible people for not using the GPL, but for me, that's always been the most interesting kind of give and take mechanism, right? You can use this great software, but then you need to contribute to this great software, right? When the whole cloud story came along, for me, the AGPL was, was the balanced license in that, but it was very unpopular with the clouds, 
you know, I think they had almost like an anaphylactic reaction, right? Like instead of being just slightly concerned about it, they went nuclear, right? Mm -hmm. um, but the truth is you need to have some balance in that relationship because the clouds do have a big advantage over the upstream project or the company that, that publishes a piece of open source. They already have all the customers. They already have the billing system. They already have the sales mechanism, right? So you do need to have some kind of give and take. I thought when we saw like SSSSPL and some of the more kind of, uh, I'd say, aggressive, almost toxic licenses, the, the sort of like the poison pill licenses, I thought, okay, well, that's the pendulum swinging too far, right? Um, and qu I'm quite glad now that we're seeing more projects who did that saying, oh, we'll come back to the AGPL. Mm -hmm. We adopted the AGPL very early. We use that for Maz, we use that for Juju, we use that for LexD. Well, LexD, the, the, one of our engineers was very passionate about doing an experiment on using the Apache license and not having a CLA and so on. So we did that experiment. It didn't make any difference. So we brought it back to our standard, which is the AGPL. Mm -hmm. For me, I think that's a nice, healthy place to be. Um, I have a certain amount of empathy for um, small businesses that are using the business source license, right? Because I think they probably feel they need to have a little bit more of a competitive edge, com competitive edge for a period, and the fact that that has a reversion to an open source license mechanism mm -hmm. is good enough for me. We won't use that. We see no need to use that as a license. We can stick with the AGPL. But honestly, anybody who's in the aggregator business, Red Hat, SUSE, Canonical, we have a we have a big advantage in business compared to say a Mongo or a you know a single a single solution provider because we can talk to a business about a, a very wide range of software rather than only about one piece of software. So again, I, you know, I think we can be a bit more conservative, a bit more relaxed about that, and use the AGPL. And it, I'm you know I'm I I I have empathy for the the true innovators, the, the people who've got like a better database or a better algorithm or a better thing, but that's the only thing they've got. I, I feel some empathy for them. And I think the BSL stuff that we're seeing seems pretty reasonable for them. Right. Um, now that may be controversial, but, but I try to look at things and say, well, in, in balance, if lots of people were to do that, how would it work out? And with, with what we do with the AGPL, and if that works for people, you just end up with projects that get more contributors and and they get better, right? And with the BSL, I think it's the same, but those companies get a little bit more of a competitive advantage for a while. They're the innovators, right? Their job is really, really hard. Our job is hard to get above the water, but their job is hard to, to like to matter at all, right? Uh, and I really, I respect the fact that they do it and they do it as open source. So. Right. So that's where I'm at on that at the moment. Okay. We are um, interested in what uh, distribution or desktop you are using privately. You also already mentioned uh, Chrome OS. Yeah. So why not Ubuntu? Is it for you okay, because so of I your love for Upstart? Or? <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> so for my own personal exploration, I use a little bit of lots of different things. Uh, in front of me now, I have two big screen TVs. One has my Ubuntu laptop on it, which is where I do all my work. And one is Chrome OS, which is where my webcam is. And so I do my, my mostly Google Hangouts on, on Google Chrome OS, and it gives me a flavor for the experiences that they're providing and, uh, and the work that they're doing to evolve the state of the art. Um, I use iOS. Not, I'm, I've never been comfortable with Android. It's not my. It doesn't feel. Doesn't fit my fingers. Um, and then I dabble a little bit. I've played a little bit um, with Arch, and uh, I have colleagues that I admire who are very passionate about Nix. So I keep getting told about Nix as well. Uh, and uh, obviously, I keep in touch with the Debian ecosystem through through mailing lists and, uh, and through what comes into Ubuntu. Mm -hmm. well, thank okay, you very, very last question. Sorry, what yeah. desktop is the Ubuntu running? Oh, I'm on uh, the latest LTS, so I'm on 2404.1 now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, uh, thank you um, for, for uh, answering all our questions and taking your time to speak to us. It was very interesting, very insightful. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Super fun to speak with you. Thank you for your questions. Thank you. Thank you.